it archaeology into the scheme of historical studies in India. And I shall be 100% honest in my assessment of the current situation. Whatever achievement archaeology in India possesses regarding its contribution to the historical knowledge of the country, those in the profession are also painfully aware of the various limitations of this contribution. The purpose of today's lecture is not to dwell on these gaps and limitations, but, but to think of an academic situation where archaeology happens to be an integral part and opens in its own way a distinct historical field. If I say that archaeology is still far from being a mainstream academic subject, I shall not be wrong. First, very few Indian universities offer a rounded training in archaeology. I do not know the exact number of universities which offer archaeology as a clear branch of study in their undergraduate and postgraduate syllabi, but I know that the number is unlikely to be more than half a dozen, and possibly that is a very charitable estimate. At the moment, I don't think that our universities have any program of offering any comprehensive training in the methods and practices of field archaeology. Think of the universities in Delhi. How many universities are there? Three at a rough count. Delhi, JNU, Jamia Emilia, and certainly half a dozen private universities around the periphery. None of them offers any course in archaeology. One or two prehistory and protohistory topics, yes. But absolutely no idea of no idea of archaeology as such. They're simply not interested. In my time, which is long back, between 1977 and 1990, I tried to offer, I tried to open a small archaeology and museum unit in Delhi University. After a few years, I was thrown out because of the trouble, because of the process, because of the pains I took. As simple as that. One thing cannot be missed, that is our historians, by and large, are not interested in archaeological studies. It is, it is not a very pleasant thing to hear, but having spent about 60 odd years in the business, that is my frank opinion. Now, one can try to change it, provide it, the scope of historical MAs in India is changed. I have given this suggestion. It is also unfortunately a part of life in India. But the study of ancient Indian history usually does not attract the bright students of history either in BA or in MA. There is no special reason, but somehow or other, the prevalent Indian idea is that the study of anything ancient is fairly useless. This has adversely affected the study of both archaeology and ancient Indian history in Indian universities. It is, it is common knowledge. There is also a ring of academic conspiracy to push ancient Indian history and archaeology out of the academic inner core of the Indian universities. I have seen this observed both in Calcutta and in Delhi. People specializing in modern Indian studies try to play the role of intellectual, quote unquote, intellectual historians in this scenario. Even in the case of modern India, it cannot simply be the case of India alone. The historical discourse, even in this case, must be embellished by references to theories and case studies in the West. And if some anthropological parameters can be thrown in, so much the better. The upshot is that the study of Indian history in modern India is very lopsided in the sense that it is dominated only by the modern Indian group among the historians. And even in that context, the emphasis is not on something earlier than the 20th century. This is in fact the study of modern India, made the study of modern India in the country a study of contemporary history. Believe me, this is true. And I think one of the reasons is the foreign universities these days are not interested in, the, in even in 20th century India. They try to understand about the social tensions, social and political tensions the country suffers from. This is as straight as that. 
they're not interested what the Marathas is in the 18th century, 19th century. Not even that, even not even what Lord Carson did, which is the beginning of the 20th century. One of the topics of a Cambridge seminar recently held in the context of modern day is problem of Boro identity. Now, this is what we Indians don't understand. Nobody has any business to study Indian history of any kind unless they're directly interested for social and political reasons in it. This is as straight as that. And the sooner the Indians understand it, the better. I spent the better part of my life working here and there, and this is my honest opinion. There is no disinterested study of any foreign land anywhere in the world. You also study various things from, from the Indian point of view. So that's a crucial issue to remember in the case of historical studies. Pursuit of pure knowledge doesn't exist in, in, in historical work. As straight as that. Somehow or other Indians believe that we study only for the sake of pure knowledge. Nothing, there is nothing called pure knowledge. The concept itself is laden with all kinds of doubts. In any case, this is in fact the study of modern India in the country, study of contemporary history. By and large, the study of ancient and medieval India hardly matters in the scheme of Indian scheme of historical education. And this is the reason why archaeology has taken such a back seat in the Indian academia. This is also the reason why bright history students generally avoid contacts with archaeology. Something to do with also with Indian literature, because I noticed that in Cambridge, if you do a first class degree in classics, Latin and Greek, you are likely to get appointed in one of the bank, big investment bank houses. A straight as that. Actually, it's considered a matter of pride <laughs> that you all the first from Cambridge and Latin and Greek classics. But in it's quite the other way. We shall not touch any email Sanskrit for anything, do we? How many lecturers in ancient Indian history are there in Delhi University? Not a lot of you are expert on this. Very few. So what's the problem? Disrespect for the nation's past, ancient past. And the sooner we acknowledge this, the better. A simple reorganization of historical studies may be brought in at this point. This is one of my crucial points. Instead of offering degrees in ancient stroke, medieval stroke, modern history, they should offer degrees in historical studies with enough flexibility to choose themes or options from any bench of historical study. MA should not be in history or ancient history, modern history, but in historical studies. Secondly, the emphasis should be on making the students closely familiar with the primary sources of whatever historical topic they may choose to study. Some hands-on experience is essential to bring about a change in the otherwise dry and dull historical academic scene in India. In fact, as far as I can make out, this is the only, which is one of the ways in which we can get out of the rut. Otherwise, the modern Indian historians will continue to dominate the historical studies of the situation. I cannot think of an Indian university where comprehensive training is given even in orthodox ancient historical subjects like epigraphy, paleography, numismatics, etc. Think again of the universities in Delhi. Do you have anybody in position or did you ever have in position any ancient historian in Delhi, including the famous ones, the so-called famous ones here and there, who can read an ancient description? My joke about them, a very famous lady ancient historian, if she's given a copy, an assemblage of an Osukan edict, 
she won't know how to hold it. Most likely she'll hold it upside down. And now she's old. <laughs> So, and none of us has been upset by the situation. It's been going on for ages. Only Dasharath, that's the man called Dasharath Sran, who did work on Rajput's history, he knew how to read inscriptions. That's the last name I can think of. This leads us to our second point. What should Indian archaeologists think of themselves, historians or scientists? In this context, it may be important to remember the following. There is a very rich historical past in India, and archaeology here has always been a major part of historical studies. More importantly, this historical past incorporates a living tradition. In India, ancient past is not a dead tradition, it's a living tradition. It's a part of ourselves, and we cannot afford to view it as an American would view the Native American past. There has been an awful amount of lecture from American colleagues on how to study ancient India, saying that our approach should be anthropological and all that. Whatever good is and political approach should be adopted. I agree with this. But to say that the orthodox historical approach is all wrong, it is completely rubbish and shows the foolishness of the scholars who argue this. I can't afford to look at ancient India on the point of an American, as an American would do the Native American past. At one point, some American archaeologists working in India sought to create a divide between the cultural historical school and the anthropological school. It was not a helpful academic point of view and it was based on an unnecessary narrow and limited view of history. One may cite a comparatively recent example of such anthropological history. There is a paper on Osoko's possible relationship with the Southern Deccan on the basis of fieldwork in the distribution area of the Osoka natives. The whole exercise being based on some network models current in anthropological literature. The paper appeared in the Anthropological Papers of the American Anthropological Association, etc. The scholar's conclusion is, I'm not naming the scholar here, it's an Indian woman. Professor, the inhabitants of the area followed, continued to follow the earlier pattern of life, remaining largely independent of Mauryan influence or control. And, and crucially, also for Dhamma Vijaya, did not imply any form of territorial sovereignty. With a cluster of edicts in the Deccan, also the edicts in the Deccan, it is very, very foolish of arguing that this close distribution of edicts did not imply any territorial control. You see, the, you see, this again is a good question of social politics of the past. For a long time, it has been interest of some people to show that the Mauryan Empire was only a cluster of small states under the overall control of the Mauryans. It did not imply territorial sovereignty over all parts of the country. Indian historians like H.P. Rai have, ar have argued it, and other people too. Obviously, this has been the crucial argument of many British and American scholars, and obviously other European scholars too. For a long time, it's been going on. In my coronary neurology, I pointed this out, but the tradition is very, is very much continuing. This case, this case is the Indian woman. She did her PhD from Chicago, I believe. Now, I know the person who teaches ancient Indian in Chicago, obviously, Kathleen Morrison. It is in her vested interest to propagate these old ideas propagate ideas which go against the integrity and sovereignty of India. As simple as that. This has been a persistent theme of historical study of, of Western approach to Indian history. Why should we be ashamed of pointing this out? Actually, I'm not ashamed to point this out, although I get attention from that part of the world.
Regarding the claim of some Indian archaeologists to be considered scientists, the first point to remember that they're mostly history MAs, and their scientific credentials are either limited to this or the possession of a past course BSc degree followed by an MA in ancient India. This unfortunately is very true and not all of us are aware of it. These days it is a very big fashion to proclaim archaeology, science and all that. But the people who do this, their basic training has always been in history, as mine has been. Either a past course BSc degree, I'm sure you are aware that a past course BSc degree means that you are at the very bottom of the Indian Academy quality. You try to make this up by doing an MA in India and then try to pose as a scientist. One particular institute in Gandhigram, Gujarat, has a section labeled as archaeological science. This is true. And even some preliminary checks establish the point that none of the concerned scientists ever possessed any science degree. To my horror, I realized there's a research scholar doing research in lipids. I don't know what lipids are in archaeological materials. Now, at the very least, you'd expect the student to be familiar with chemist chemical techniques. She also remain history. Disaster. They make believe we are always ready to undergo. It can be fairly shocking. And this shows the enormous scale of academic dishonesty which is crept up in the Indian Academy. I'm sorry, I'm, well, I'm brutally frank, but this is the correct estimate. And this Gujarat Institute is IIT Gandhigram. The situation is as interesting as the Deccan College prehistorians, who are mostly history MAs, but enthusiastically talk of the word geomorphology and claim to contribute to Pleistocene geomorphology. Academic honesty does not seem to be the best part of the training of such prehistorians. There is also a recent case at the same institute, the Deccan College Pune, where the archaeologist to a specific skeleton lends his name as an author of the article on ancient DNA obtained from that skeleton. In the more honest academic days, the archaeologist concerned would have handed over the skeleton to a suitable person for ancient DNA studies and kept his own opinion of the ancient DNA to himself because he has no business or professional training to proclaim anything on ancient DNA. That used to be the system. You find an important thing, you hand it over for analysis to a proper scientist and keep yourself out of it. The Archaeological Survey of India used to hand over its excavated bones for identification to Bolanath of the Geological Survey of India. I don't know what is the situation now. The survey itself has been running a separate science branch in Daradun for many years now. And as long as Dr. B. Bilal is not Dr. B. Bilal, who died recently, he was the archaeological chemist in charge there. It used to produce worth mentioning work. I don't know which type of research is pursued there now. As far as the preservation of ancient paintings is concerned, one cannot say the chemists of the survey have a good run. I can think of a number of places where the quality of paintings has sharply deteriorated under the care of the survey specialists. This is true. The Pallava period paintings at Sittanavastal near Pudukutta in Tamil Nadu are now completely destroyed, and even the Ajanta paintings have lost their original luster in the care of the survey. This again is painfully true. I first went to Ajanta in the early 60s, possibly 1961. And the first thing which struck me was the depth 
and the brightness of the color of the paintings. Even the dark caves were simply have been lead with this unforgettable experience. And that is why Ajanta became Ajanta. Over the years, there has been a sharp deterioration in the quality of the paintings, in the color of the paintings, because they put a wrong type of chemical over it. A chemical which drew dirt from the atmosphere. This is the they were almost murdered Ajanta. In this red gathering, I should make that comment. They were almost murdered Ajanta. Although these days there is a lot of thing about not allowing cars, etc., vehicles emitting smoke in the vicinity of the caves. You have to go there by trolley and so on. But they've murdered the, the whole historical point in these paintings. If one is to go far back in time, the entire geological and metallurgical analysis of many other objects was done either by the geological survey or the chemist of the survey itself. These days, I gather that the relevant material of the whole of the excavations, on which the government reputedly spent many crores of rupees, possibly hundreds of crores of rupees, was handed over to some American students. That's a real disgrace. With the geological survey of India around and the experts, you don't hand over the, pri the priceless specimens of your priceless site to a handful of youngsters trying to do their PhDs. And that to foreign students. You see, we Indians suffer from a peculiar complex. We Indian economists always try to be, how do I put it, internationally famous persons in our fields. That's one of the serious complexes in India, we, we Indian economists have. Which is a disaster. So the excavator of Olavira obviously thought that you would get extra fame if we handed over the specimens to some American scholars for analysis. This, the quote unquote, science situation in Indian archaeology is really bad. There is no central scientific body or laboratory to look up to, and people with history MAs have begun to masquerade shamelessly as scientists. By a curious understanding of the scope of archaeology, it's a part of the Ministry of Culture, where its proper place should have been in the Ministry of Education, or whatever they call it now. The scientific aspects of archaeology ought to have found shelter in the Science and Technology Ministry. At the very least, there could be a few laboratories set up on the CSIR model in various parts of the country for archaeological material analysis and dating. They could easily have done this, set up at least one or two CSI type laboratories to begin with. One of the reasons why archaeology has not yet been able to establish firmly in the university setup is the erratic and essentially subjective character of archaeological research finding. Unless you create a lobby of your own, both in the wings of the survey and in the ministries, you cannot find your way in archaeological field research. This is God's own truth, not the blabbering of a cynical old man. My own excavation at a small site in West Bengal in 1982 was done with a budget of 7,000 rupees, an insignificant sum even by the standard of the day. My only receipt from the ICHR so far has been rupees 1000 for my work on the RDUs of iron in India. I would say that the survival, of the survival in the jungle of archaeological affairs in, the, in India is a very painful process 
and I'm not surprised the bright student is generally avoided. I am nobody to speak about inner mechanisms that are those outside of India, but I gather that now the excavations can be conducted privately. You see, till recently, archaeological survey of India has been divided, always been divided into a number of circles, right? And the chief man of the circle could do any excavation he liked. Nowadays, they have separated, designated those circles which are allowed to do excavations. This means whether the government of India archaeologists, you can estimate it or not, depends on which branch of archaeology you are posted in. This has considerably narrowed the scope of excavations of field research in the country. I remember the time when the pleasure of conducting an excavation belonged to all archaeologists of the survey, and by sheer hard work, some of them could establish a national reputation in the field. There was a time when the superintendents of circles were considered scholars in their own right. Some of them are still around, but regrettably, many superintendents do not have to do anything with academic research now. Currently, I'm doing a book, Archaeologists of Independent India, a review of their work and personalities. Regrettably, the names of modern ASA officials are difficult to locate in this context. There was also a time when there was a sincere feeling of brotherhood in the archaeology profession in the country. I myself turned up in many establishments of the survey, seeking and in fact getting help of all kinds, although I did not belong to the survey. This October, I turned up in Chanderi's conservation office in the hope of getting somebody to accompany me to the local sites. Politely but unceremoniously, I shown the door. The only concern of the ASI people in the precincts of the Dasavatara temple near Loritpur, and by the way, that contains possibly the finest ancient sculpture of the country, was that the car which I had hired to go there should be kept outside the compound. That was the only concern of the local keepers. The point is, there has obviously been a sea change in the culture of the archaeological survey of India. There is also no reason to forget that there are many state departments of archaeology that need a fair bit of work in their time. I can name some very respectable archaeologists from among these departments, but in 2022, I really cannot think of anybody who is doing useful academic work in these departments on history account. The primary emphasis of both the survey and the state departments these days is the conservation. I should add that it is conservation is propounded by the so-called conservation architects who believe in the reconstruction of damaged parts. It is not the conservation as preached by John Marshall in his conservation policy manual in 1915 or 16. It is this policy which has kept the Indian heritage structures standing so long. That is John Marshall's policy, his techniques. This has kept this monument standing for so long. Characters that one comes across these days talking about conservation, the so-called intact specialists, are sheer poison to old archaeological characters like the present speaker. They are certainly like the pump or sahibs or memsites who write columns and heritage and history writing in their newspapers and magazines. I do not know enough of the Indian conservation scene to comment in depth on it. But I do know this is where money lies, and this is where various unsavory characters congregate. Archaeology basically is only small talk in this context. That the conservation lobby in the country far outweighs any archaeological lobby the country may have it has been shown by the establishment of an organization parallel to the survey. The establishment of the National Monument Authority is inexplicable to me because the monument documentation and protection has always, had always been the brief of the survey. The survey can protect and conserve any monument it likes. What explanation do our heritage people offer for the formation of a separate parallel organization? 
In fact, there is none. Except that some person can be made the chairman and members, etc. Possibly have a much better idea of government authority of India. Completely needless. I wonder which brain conceived this idea. How much money the authorities spend on actual archaeological field work every year and how much on conservation? Do you have a right to know? It is well known that there is now no professional archaeologist at the helm of affairs of the archaeological service of India. Being used to meet senior professional archaeologists as the head of the survey, one would in fact hesitate to acknowledge non archaeologist as the director general of archaeology in the country. There was a time when the chief of the archaeological survey of India used to be considered by and respected by all of us as a chief archaeologist of the country. The post had a tremendous status. Now, if you ask me, I don't even know the name of the director general of the archaeological survey of India. This is true. How does it matter to archaeologists? By changing the succession rule of the post, what the senior most person would inherit his top job, the death nail of professional prestige of this post was founded many years ago. This is true. Those of us who have an interest in the history of the survey and the history of archaeology under it can have no feeling except that of content for the current economic plight of the civilization. I wish I knew why and how the succession rules of the survey were changed. Whose interest did this change in rules serve? I should also comment something on the way archaeology is organized in this country. There is nothing wrong with the way it is organized on the public level. The implementation of this organizational principle is, however, hidebound and too bureaucratic to serve any kind of academic purpose. I have no grievance against the way it is organized by the government of India and by the way it is funded. I think for the third world country, of course, I can't say it's a third world country now, but on the whole, government of India spends, again, sorry, you are the best man to comment on it. I think government of India spends a lot of money on the archaeological work or different kinds, conservation included. You see, but there's a simple rule in some countries, I know. Before initiating any kind of project requiring large-scale digging of the earth, in the countryside or elsewhere, archaeological investigation of that area is mandatory and the required expenditure will be borne by the project fund, of which a percentage is reserved for the purpose. So if, you're, if you've got a project to spend, say, about crore rupees in laying a railway line or something across the countryside, you have to have it surveyed first archaeologically. And a small part of the budget, very small, but part of the budget nonetheless, is reserved for the purpose. This has greatly widened the scale and scope of archaeological research in the country, so that this tool has been implemented. Many British universities, for instance, have their commercially run archaeology units. Say, so if the local council advertises an archaeological work survey, etc., to be conducted on a particular stretch of land. You will compete, you will submit tenders for it, the various units of archaeology units of different universities. And one of them will be granted the job. If the tender is accepted, they will do the work, they will publish the work, they will analyze the materials and scan preserve it. Excellent system. What, whenever the local authorities advertise for some archaeological investigation to be done under this rule, the archaeology unit submit tenders for the job and, if successful, carry out the necessary investigation, including excavation, and publish the necessary reports without wasting time. This is practical archaeology at its best. 
and involves active cooperation with relevant science specialists on the local level. What prevents us Indians from passing this rule? Many years ago, I came across a World Bank specialist, an American lady, who was trying her best to introduce this law in India. That before we undertake extensive construction work, road building, etc., etc., you get area surveyed archaeologically. She was not successful. I suppose I can guess the reason. This will upset. Again, this is true. This will upset the elaborate structure. If you pass a rule like that, this will upset the elaborate structure of getting your work officially permitted. That elaborate ritual of sucking up with the person who will give you permission, etc. That's, that's very important. It will also be important to be on the right side of the members of the Central Archaeology Advisory Board. So, because these people have their grip of the whole procedure, they are unlikely to do anything which will loosen this grip. I will not say that on the university level, where the speech is supposed to be academic, of the situation less bureaucratic, your head of the department may be completely unfamiliar with the political investigations, but the license to dig will be in his name. And if his unduly ambitious, he will expect his department archaeology teacher to draw his line and keep his name in all publications. I can think of many universities that often sign the names of people involved in this. There are many cases of this type in our universities, and it is only sheer politeness which prevents me from giving the specifics of the cases as names. Compared to the central or state government organizations of archaeology, the university archaeology people, unless they can carry out the lobbying effectively, are awfully starved of funds. In Indian universities, there is also a question of primary raising the funds. In Allahabad, the archaeology people, under the leadership of G.R. Sharma, established such a close relationship with the local village people that are willing to dig a daily wage earners in the field without receiving any payment till the money for it was officially released. It's unbelievable, but this is true. The field camp used to be run on the basis of loans given by the local shopkeepers. I have the highest respect for the archaeological research initiated in that region by G.S. Sharma. And my brief exposure to the archaeology as pursued by his group in 1982 has been among the most cherished archaeological memories of mine. Finally, I shall raise a delicate issue. The issue of relationship between archaeology and nationalism in India. I have a number of publications on this issue, but they've been mostly ignored. Since Mortimer Wheeler and some Western masters made us feel as scientists and theoreticians, we in Indian archaeology at least have stopped bothering for the nation. This is not fun, this is hard truth. This is a situation which is true of the Indian Academy in general. Nation has no place here. I shall not embarrass my colleagues from the Nakam College Pune by reminding them of that all their chief archaeologists, with the exception of S.B. Deo, took a clearly international position. To one of them, India was always a colony. This is true. S.B. Shankarya wrote this as late as 1974. This language, India was always a colony. To another, and Kerabarika, the India settlements in Gujarat were like the establishments of the early British commercial settlers in that region. That is, they were outsiders. The Indus people in Gujarat were outsiders, were there only for commercial exploitation resources. Another gentleman of the same institute wrote about the prehistoric colonization of the country. Colonization was the word actually used. There is also a fourth one who would view an American archaeologist as a kind of demigod of theories of great value in the eridly mundane world of Indian archaeology. 
The cases from the archaeologists from Bodhodara, Bodhoda are known as edifying. And such attitudes are limited not merely to top archaeologists of Pune, Bodhod, and other places with the students, but they also have come down to the line. How do you think this happened? All this Deccan College Pune has all been National Institute for a long time. And possibly of the resources and equitable development to the archaeology groups in the country here and there, it is a Deccan College which gets the most important chunk of that. There's no doubt about it. How is it that this institute has been parceling implicitly or directly an international environment. This is an international system. This is a bomb maker of a kind, but you sabotage basically your respect for your own past. And why this issue has not been raised? And even if this issue has been raised by characters like me, they're completely ignored. This is a serious matter. In my moments of anger, I I feel that we the archaeologists in the post independence period have been essentially the imams, if I can use this word. Why? Why this complex? Why when people like Lefer and General Sony are the sword nation first, um, I, I, I a hard by like an academic I'm surprised because it is something which you need, which you never hear in Indian Academy. Not even by mistake. How is it that all your smart people, all your smart public intellectuals take basically an anti Indian line? Why? There must be some reason. Europe scholarships or Europe free ride to a Western conference. What is it that impels us? There should be free and honest discussion on these topics, very unpleasant topics. What is happening at the moment, you see, is fairly dangerous. The Indus civilization, all of us are familiar with it. Delhi has a number of Indus sites. Um, and the point is that the Indus, Indus settlement is crucial to the understanding of the Indian high tradition. For two reasons. First of all, if you look at the very spread of the civilization, it's it is spread from North Afghanistan. And even if you leave aside North Afghanistan, one is to take in Balochistan, the farthest border of Balochistan, to the Godavari River. At a site called Daimabad, they found in the spirit. Daimabad, in Godavari River, Godavari. And again, from Baritistan to Horizon. This is the classic form of Indian civilization, distribution of the Indian civilization. One of its manifestations, what you call copper covered pottery or copper root culture, this has been found distributed as far south as Alawa. Not Exactly, Lawat, Singbeerpur, not far from Lawat. So, and this civilization lasted, the tradition, civilization tradition lasted from about 3500 BC to about 1200 BC. Look at the chronology and look at the geographical spread. Can you imagine that this civilization? was only a regional thing? No, it can never be. It's as straight as that. These days, some people, Indians included, they began to argue 
that Hindu civilization was not a civilization in that sense. It was only a vineyard, a plywood vineyard, you can say, pasted on the top of various regional elements. Look at the implications. I suppose all of us are aware that there was, there was a time when people used to deny the very existence of Hinduism, including some who were very modern historians. Hinduism did not exist till the Western scholars invented it. True. It's written in history books. Uh, there was no Hinduism, there was Shoigism, Vishnavism, etc. People forgot to mention that there was also despite these variations, an overarching unity, a consort Vikra Bodhavan. So it is like this. Obviously, such a large territory, there will be regional manifestations of water styles and so on. But it is not trying to, to lump the whole thing as the only cluster of regional elements. They're doing it, began to do it. Why? In that book towards national pursuit or whatever which I wrote and copy of this library i pointed out the names etc etc see but what can you do about these things the government of india now issues an open door of parcels an open door policy in relation to foreign archaeologists i have nothing against foreign archaeologists because I've earned my livelihood among them. No problem at all. But the point is that if as a first world person, you work in the third world, you all try to respect the nation's integrity. This is something you don't mess with. This is one of the classic academic ethics of archaeology. You are welcome to pursue your studies anywhere in the world, but always remember not to upset the local. As simple as that. Why foreign archaeologists in India always ups upset the basic ethics of archaeological field research? And they do it imprudently. Because they have got their Indian satellites. As we are talking very frankly today, let me give you a specific example. A gentleman has retired from Wisconsin. For many years, he excavated a heart pile in Pakistan. Now, consider this modern archaeological situation. These days, archaeological fieldwork means mixing with the locals, local people, and so on. You have to know the countryside very well, etc., etc. Between North Africa and Pakistan, there is no place safe for those to archaeologists at the moment. Which archaeologist should now try, which Western archaeologist, which colleague of mine will now try to go to Syria to excavate a site? You see the point? Which colleague of mine will go to Egypt to excavate, it, to, excav to do excavations? Egypt also is to start in various ways. So, a lot of eyes are on Egypt. They have to justify their post, they have to justify their existence, they have to pursue research. There's a lot of pressure on these people. So in India, India is a softest country. Because you have a bunch of local cap followers. As straight as that. I was talk, talking of this man for Wisconsin. He excavated in Pakistan for many years. He believes that Pakistan is a democratic country. I'm not joking. I cited him extensively. All in his words. And Quran advises you to do archaeology. Etc. etc. Now, because Pakistan is close to him, he has shifted his attention to India and it's a number of Indian followers. Now, that man has another aspect of his past, which is worth looking at. 
A few years back, there was an unpleasant controversy in California regarding the position of Hinduism as mentioned in some textbooks. This is known as California textbook controversy. To start in the Google, they drop the controversy, no, no problem. Very interesting. Now, this man, this archaeologist mine, actually his book was the root of all troubles. People took exception to how we depicted Hinduism in his book. The parents of the American Indian school children. It's a famous case. Now, I know in, I know I know in here in which this gentleman was invited invited to a seminar in, in Indian Institute of Technology Gandhi Ground at the Government of India expense because they took a grant from the ICHR to invite him. You see the point. Normally, you would think that in this country, if a recognized Indian person, and I gave details of the man in my book called Battle for Ancient India. It is all there in print. Nobody took any notice of it, took money from the ICHR to invite him. In any case, he's still invited. Uh, and he has got his Indian supporters. What can you do? About Government of India apparently doesn't have any attitude in this regard. Actually, if you if you apply for excavations in Greece, they will do a security clearance on it. Either a security apparatus is very weak in this space, or it doesn't bother. My own suggestion is that in the sites, this is crucial for our own research and respect, it should not be allowed by any person outside the archaeological side of India. At least the government of India has such specific rules for behavior of officers. I do gather specific rules, but the Indian universities, they don't bother. You can behave in any way like this is a dangerous situation. In many, many years ago, during the time of the East India Company, or earlier than that, how the European traders traded in this country? By employing local Banyans. So what we practice in India is Banyan archaeology. Some large groups move in with a lot of funds. They have their local contacts, their bunions, to explore the local market, and that's it. If the archaeological survey of India is not aware of it, that is their business. And obviously, the archaeological survey of India is not run by professional archaeologists. So they are not expected to have a very clear idea of the nitty gritty of the profession or the dark side of the profession. So basically, this is the state of Indian archaeology today. I cannot give you a, a satisfactory picture, but the picture is far from being satisfactory. Not merely that, these days it is running on dangerous grounds nationalism, anti-nationalism, etc. And I'm sure the international forces are winning the day. Nobody bothers for nationalistic integration of archaeological data. Another thing, at this moment, we are at a very serious juncture of internal historical studies. This question of the relationship between the Indus civilization and the Vedic tradition. Rather, one of the you must be aware, I have always been dead against this correlation. The Vedic tradition should be kept separate. These days, unfortunately, in view of certain discoveries, 
I have to accept that these two traditions are one and the same. One and the same. The, the details of this correlation still remain to be worked out and will require a lot of patience and a lot of very serious basic scholarship with that one is not have. But still, we cannot deny the fact that the Vedic tradition was once a part of the archaeological tradition too. And especially at this moment, if Indian archaeology is given a free run by all sorts of people, then it's become really dangerous for the nation. You see, archaeology has always been largely political. Why do you think there are so many large-scale expeditions in the Middle East? All for the sake of knowledge? Are you joking? No. Why do you think Paul Stein conducted so many expeditions in Central Asia? In those days, espionage was more this clumsy affair. In the sense, and you need binoculars, sort of mixing with the local people, etc. These days, I'm sure um, intelligence gathering is far more sophisticated. But in those days of clumsy intelligence gathering, archaeologists used to play very important roles. But at the same time, we don't know that with the kind of equipment people have these days, a clever archaeologist comes fledging, or an intelligence man comes fledging as an archaeologist, can do in the borderlands of India, Pakistan, etc. It's, it's in all the areas where the investigation sites can be found. Come to India, has no control over them. There was a time when the government of India was far more cautious. They, they refused a French group, a good French group, permission to do any work in Haryana, to do excavation work in Haryana. Now our government feels that setting up big museums in a few places will set things right. It will not set things right. The last month, a lot of money has been spent on setting up museums here and there. That's about it. Thank you all. And I'm ready for any kind of questions.